Well, I'm guessing that parents who look up during the weekend and get your children kind of set for worship and what we're going to talk about probably already noticed this. Those of you who don't have children, hopefully you did it on your own. You notice uh, that the emblem that I sent out in the Friday morning email and then that was featured on the cover of the bulletin has the five solos, which God willing, parents, you've gone over those to remind your children what the five solos are. Adults, hopefully you've reminded yourself what the five solos are. And of course, the highlight sola for today is sola scriptura, as you can see on the cover of the bulletin and all that email that we sent out to prepare you, to give you a chance to prepare your hearts to come to the Lord and worship today. So sola scriptura in today's sermon is from dust, life. Isn't it awesome that we come into the presence of a God who can raise life from dust, from dust. You know what you and I are, right? We're dust, and to dust we will return. But as we see in the opening chapters of Genesis, God raises people from dust to life. And we serve a God in Jesus Christ who can raise those who have died and returned to the dust to life eternal with him. Amen? That's part of our message today for From Dust to Life. And we are again focusing on sola scriptura. Scripture alone brings forth a church of people who are saved in just the way I was talking about. From dust to life. People who live and because they live, they produce. I mean, people who are alive produce. They're not dead leaves that just kind of look pretty and get buried. They are living, productive. They're fruitful and they multiply. By his word, by his word, Sola Scriptura, Jesus creates from dust a church of living disciples who live in him, bringing forth fruit. Saved people belonging to God, raised from dust to life, bring forth fruit. Fruit of worship. I mean, think about what we're preparing to commit to the Lord in the coming month. To worship in a living way. To give in a living way. To serve and minister and be engaged in his mission in a living way. Because after all, it just doesn't make sense, right? Right? God is the author of life. If we believe in him and have a relationship with him, are we going to be dead? No. The Father is abundantly generous. He keeps giving and giving to the point that my cup overflows. The scripture says that all good gifts come from the Father. So if I have any kind of relationship with God the Father, if I'm actually a child of God, if I can actually, with any integrity or life, pray, our Father in heaven, then I'm going to be a giver, right? Because God is what? A giver. Anybody who's actually a Christian, I'm not talking about religious people who come to church and say, well, I, you know, don't bother me about that. I'm talking about like people who actually belong to the Father. They're going to give. Ultimately, he gave his own son. I mean, you want to talk about a giver, right? And, and what about serving? If I have a relationship with Jesus... He served so much that he gave his life for us. He got down on his knees and washed his unfaithful disciples' feet. That's, that's how much he served. So if I have any kind of relationship with him, if I actually believe in Jesus, and it's not just words, there's going to be fruit. There's going to be a lot of service, a lot of mission, a lot of serving. That's just what we look at today. And so we can rejoice that if you are a believer in Jesus, you're going to worship lavishly. I mean, he's going to do it through you. You're going to give generously, first and foremost, to his kingdom, to his church, to his mission. And you are going to. This is awesome. You can celebrate this victory that you have in Christ. You're going to serve. You're going to serve and change lives with his mission. So we're continuing to work our way through Luke's gospel, and, and in particular, Luke chapter 8. Uh, last Sunday, we preached from 
Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. That's the 22nd of October. If you missed that, go back and, and listen to the sermon from last week, YouTube, online, podcast. It links with today. So let's just pick up where we are now. Luke chapter 8, verse 4, and reading through verse 15. Hear now God's word. When a large crowd was gathering and those from each town came to him, this means to Jesus, came to him, he spoke by a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed. And in his sowing, some fell along the path, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. The other seed fell on the rock. And as it grew, it withered away, having no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And other seed fell into the good soil. And growing up, it brought forth fruit a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, The one who has ears, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him what this parable might mean. He said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but for the rest they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, but these have no root. They who believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell into the thorns, these are those who hear, but as they make their way, are choked under the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and they bring forth no fruit to maturity. But that, in the good soil, these are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. If you happen to be a world traveler, you may have been to Geneva. And if you went to Geneva, if you went anywhere near Geneva, I certainly hope you went to the old city of Geneva, not just there, but specifically to, of course, the Reformation Park there in the old city of Geneva with the Reformation Wall. And there above the statues of Pharaoh, Beza, Calvin, and Knox with the side monuments to Luther and to Zwingli on either side of that, there up in that huge, massive script in the monument there are three Latin words. What are those words? Well, it's the motto of the Reformation. If you're kind of a student, if you're a Presbyterian, certainly if you're an elder or somebody who's actually studied church history, you probably know, right? Post tenebras lux. You got it in the sermon notes. You can fill it in now. Post tenebras lux. What does it mean? After darkness, light. After darkness, light. Now that became the overall Reformation motto. If you happen to know a lot about history, you know that Luther had a separate motto from that for his ministry, but you may know, and I'm going to tell you today, you know, we're Presbyterians, so we're kind of in the Calvin Knox line. This was John Calvin's originally personal ministry motto that became the overall magisterial Protestant motto, okay? After darkness, light. But how? How? How do you break the darkness with light? Well, you ought to know the answer to this right now. What are we focusing on today? The Word of God. God's Word. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. Spirit hovering. 
God said, what? Notice he said it. It's by word, not by wrestling with the big serpent or dragon or something like that. God speaks. God said, let there be light. And there was or, Hebrew, light. John 1, verse 4. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light, greater than the darkness. Now, today I'm going to give you another motto. It's not up in Geneva. You know, it's not in the Reformation Park that some of y'all have visited. Um, De pulvis vita, vitae. Uh, just using church pronunciation here now, the Latin. Uh, from, what? From dust life. From dust, life. I just kind of made that one up for you, but it's a good motto, right? And it goes to the sermon title today. Genesis 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man from the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, if you go to the New Testament, you learn that there's a first Adam. That's the one back in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and so on. But thank God we have a second Adam, Jesus, okay? And what 1 Corinthians 15 tells us is that, you know, Adam was dust and he became a living soul, nefesh. But the second Adam, Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. <laughs> He's the big deal. He's the word of God. You want to go with the second Adam, not the first one. Um, and so anyone who is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, is a what? New creation. Circle back around to what we're talking about, Genesis 1 and 2. And how does this happen? By the word of God. Sola Scriptura leads to, the word of God leads to a church of people saved from dust to life. But how? Again, you ought to be able to answer this. You're getting it over and over again. By how? The word of God. God's word. Isaiah 55, verse 11. So shall the Lord says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty or void, but shall accomplish what I purpose. In other words, when God sends his word, sovereignty of God, reformed faith, folks, it does what it's supposed to do. And how are we saved? Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, through the word of Christ. So Sola Scriptura leads to his church by the word of Christ, people saved from dust to life, who live and who produce. I mean, just guarantee, this is awesome. If I'm a Christian, if I'm actually born again in Jesus, I'm going to produce. My production doesn't save me, but is a testimony to his greatness at work in me, his spirit at work in me, his word at work in me. I'm going to produce. I'm going to be fruitful and multiply, just like God commanded the original people on earth to be. Be fruitful and multiply, Genesis chapter 1. Their works will glorify God. What a thought. What is my purpose in life? To plan for my retirement. Is that my purpose in life? To make myself comfortable. To surround myself with everybody who just likes me and does what I want them to do. Is that my purpose in life? To avoid harm. Is that my purpose in life? To avoid pain at all costs. I'll take whatever pill you give me. Just help me avoid pain. Is that my purpose in life? No. According to what we believe in this church, my chief end is to do what? Glorify myself? Take care of myself? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Their works glorify God. Anybody who's a Christian, you're, just gonna, you're gonna produce, you're gonna worship, you're gonna give, you're gonna serve. It's just guaranteed, it's awesome and it glorifies God. Jesus says, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. John chapter 15, verse eight, we'll come back to this one. By this, my Father is glorified. How is the Father glorified? That you bring forth much fruit 
Christian, you're fruit, okay? But you bring forth much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Anybody who's a disciple is going to be very fruitful in their worship, in their giving, in their commitment, in their discipleship, in their ministry. It's just guaranteed. Now, today, let's pull back and understand where we are in Luke's gospel. Luke chapters 4 through 7. We see, first of all, this amazing theme as Jesus begins his public ministry about the majesty, the majesty of God's kingdom and grace. Jesus and his word, the gospel of Christ, that he preaches and that he enacts are fully true, necessary, and effective to save from sin, from the devil, from death. Now, this is the majesty. His gospel is fully effective. It will save. It will save from sin, death, the devil. But then we come to the mysteries that we see in tension with the majesty and the sovereignty of the gospel, the mysteries of God's kingdom and grace. It's true, Jesus' word are true and necessary to save, right? But then we see this. Some hear and believe and are made new, but others rejected his word. Did you know that 2,000 years ago? Did you know that actually happens today too? Did you know that everybody who lives in the United States is not passionately worshiping Jesus right now? Did y'all know that? It's just not. I mean, like a whole lot of people aren't. Even so-called, you know, Bible Belt nominal Christians. Others reject his word, and still others, they're interested to listen. Well, that was kind of a nice sermon today. I like that song today. And they'll kind of take it into consideration, but they're still in charge of their lives, not God. Hmm. They're not transformed into disciples. So we're dealing with the spectrum that we've already been reading about in Luke chapters 4 through 7. You've got many religious, very successful in life Jews who are not cottoning to Jesus that much. They may be interested for a time and then they get put off by him. Didn't like that sermon. Didn't like what he said about that. And then you have people like Simon the Pharisee who's interested to be enlightened a little bit more and may consider Jesus to be a prophet. I'll, I'll kind of consider it. I'll show up. And then you have the crowds. You know about crowds, right? Well, as we see them develop, a lot of these people in these crowds in Luke, they're just people who like being in the crowd. The music's great. The, the excitement is great. Jesus is a great speaker. So they'll come and be part of the crowd, but they aren't disciples. And it turns out there's a huge difference between coming for the big show, you know, like the church show, and actually being with Jesus. There's a big difference there. And then we come to stories about people like the, the centurion who totally believes in Jesus like all out. And the forgiven and healed women from the sinful woman at the end of Luke chapter 7 who cries all over Jesus' feet and anoints his feet and gives, gives him his, you know, lavish faith, lavish giving. I mean, just over the top. And then all these lavish, highly gratitude motivated by the grace of God women that we just read about in Luke 8, 1 through 3 who are financing Jesus' ministry. They're giving like their first and best to support his developing church. It's an amazing group of people. So here we are as we roll into Luke chapter 8 and certainly verses 1 through 21 dealing with this ongoing developing tension of the, the tension between the majesty and the mysteries of the kingdom and grace of God. Jesus, by his word, creates a church of hearers who bear fruit while many others don't believe. You may have people in your own friendship group or maybe even in your own family. You may have children, you know, that you kind of dragged to church when they were young, but they're not on fire for the Lord now. They may not even be connected. I mean, that's, that's just kind of right. So some people, like some people are, believe and are totally changed. And some people are kind of like, well, I'll kind of think about it. If it suits my pleasure, I'll kind of dig in a little bit. And then some people are totally out. You may know that range in your own life. So uh, where we are in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, as we said last week, Jesus preaches and brings the kingdom gospel in word, and not only now in, in, in doing and work, but also specifically in this developing koinonia of a church. And then in the middle, Luke 8, verses 4 through 18, parables and teaching on hearing and living the word fruitfully. And then Luke 8, 
19 through 21. Remember, this has a frame on it. So we had the first frame of the women and the apostles who were with Jesus, the little family group. And on the other side, verses 19 through 21, the other frame, where Jesus specifically identifies his true family as people who hear and do his work. People who hear and do his work. That's his family. Today, we are focusing in on a big swath of this middle section, Luke 8, 4 through 15, the parable of the sower and the seed and the soils. Now, I got to remind you of this. Parables do two things, just like I was talking about with the Word of God. They reveal and conceal. To some people, they reveal who God is in salvation. And to other people whose hearts are against God, it's just, I mean, it's, it's concealing. What, what's he talking about? And notice that in Luke chapter 8, verse 10, Jesus quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9. And you know when I preached through Isaiah a few years ago, I pointed out to you that although everybody looks, here I am, send me, the, the, the verse that's quoted so heavily in the New Testament, in fact, the most directly quoted, I mean, it runs through the Gospels, through Paul's ministry, all the way to the end, is this statement and the call that God gives Isaiah is I will make their hearts fat and I'm going to stop up the ears of people who don't want to hear me. We'll double down on this. If you're rejecting me, God says, it's going to be worse when you hear the word of God. So parables revealing, and so Jesus says to you, he's talking to his disciples and these women who follow him, to you it has been given to know the mysteries, mysteria of the kingdom of God, but for the rest they are in parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. It's quoting from Isaiah 6. Again, remember, parables reveal or conceal. And the issue is, are we talking about open good hearts or divided, unguarded, distracted, shallow, or hard hearts? It has a lot to do with the, the soil or, if you will, the heart. So the parable of the sower, the seeds, and the soils. Sower seed is this Christ word that Paul is talking about in Romans 10. Christ's word is life and it brings life to good hearts. But we have concerns. We have concerns with unguarded hearts, overscheduled hearts. Does anybody know any overscheduled hearts? Um, shallow hearts and distracted hearts. And we come here to the reality check of spiritual warfare. See, how we hear and whether we hold to the preaching of God's word is a huge spiritual warfare issue. We just said from the Shorter Catechism, for the word to become effective for salvation, we must pay careful attention to it, prepare ourselves, and pray for understanding. Parents, are you teaching your children that? Or do you just expect them to kind of show up and act nice and that's it. <laughs> Being a Christian parent is a lot deeper than that. What about yourself? We must pay careful attention to it, prepare ourselves, pray for understanding. We must also receive it in faith and love, treasure it in our hearts, and notice this, and practice it in our lives. Parents, where are you? Where will you be 30 minutes from now? Will you, let me just be honest with you, will you be in the Word with your children? Or will the sermon be a check mark and you're moving on to think about really important stuff like food and sports and, I don't know, goofing around? I mean, if you are training your children, your teenagers, to come in and kind of listen in one ear and out the other, well, we got that done. I kind of got something out of it, but an hour later I can't tell you what I got out of it. Man, you are actually doubling down on distracted hearts that will not receive the gospel. Are you able to talk with and pray through with your children what God's word is actually saying? Are you actually taking time on the Lord's day to live in the word of God? Couples, are you doing it with your spouse? If you're single, are you doing it with friends? I mean, just, just walk through what your Sunday afternoon looks like how much word there is in it, and how you are raising up your children to actually respond and not be overscheduled and distracted, to actually receive the word unto salvation. Because after all, I have to tell you, an award here, 
a game won there, that has no eternal significance. Salvation, let me just say, it's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Salvation. Spiritual warfare, but we have the great calling. Parents, spouses, to help lead others in spiritual victory in Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? That's, that's what he's inviting us to. So the parable of the sower seeds and soils. Sower seed, the word goes out. You have the ones along the path, verses 5 and verse 12, as Jesus explained. Jesus says, they hear, but the devil takes away the word from their hearts. I mean, it's easy. They're unguarded. They're clueless. If they actually hear the word, like in, in our case, they actually show up at church, but the devil takes it right out of them. It's awesome. For the devil, it's horrible for souls. Unguarded hearts, no faith, no salvation. Jesus says, so they won't be saved. Uh, what about the root, rootless ones on the rocky soil? Verse 6, verse 13. They hear and receive joyfully and believe for a while. You may know people like this. You know, they're kind of part of the crowd. If they go to the youth group and everybody's raising their hand to believe, you know, or like the, the music's good, I feel good about it. It's almost like being at a rock concert. I'm going to believe too. Yeah, they have joy. Uh, I kind of believe for a while. But in time of testing, Jesus says they fall away. That means they are not really saved. They fall away, just like what we're reading about on Tuesday morning with the men's group in Revelation. There's no root and there's no fruit. And really, strong word from 2 Peter on this. After they escape the world's defilements through knowing Jesus, they are entangled again and, over, and they're overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandments delivered to them. Ooh. Tough warning there. And calling us, though, out of God's grace to salvation, right? Uh, one more of these in the thorns, verse 7 and verse 14. They hear, but they are choked by life's cares, riches, pleasures, and do not bring forth fruit to maturity. Now, you can get in all kind of technical excuses, and are these people possibly, well, yeah, you know, if you're saved. But look, if you're saved, let's just look at what Jesus says. Whoever abides, John 15, whoever abides, and the term there, the verb there is manao, remains. Whoever remains in me brings forth much fruit. If anyone does not abide in me, does not remain in me, he's thrown into the fire. That's John 15, verse 6. That's the words of Jesus now. But now look, look at the awesome opportunity. Some in good soil, hearing the word, they hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance, just like what we're reading about in Revelation, guys, okay? Tuesday mornings. And sole deo gloria, they hold fast to it with good hearts. As Jesus puts it this way, talking about last times, end times, Matthew 24, 13, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. The one who perseveres will be saved. So Jesus says they bring forth fruit with perseverance, these good hearts, these honest hearts. And then again, John 15, verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bring forth polycarpus, much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So today on this Reformation Sunday, we can celebrate the power, the majesty of God's word and his gospel invitation to each of us and to our households, to our children and teenagers as well. By his word, Jesus creates from dust a church of disciples who live in him, who are alive in a living faith in him, bringing forth much fruit. To God alone be the glory from scripture alone. Scripture alone, grace alone, grace alone. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to God's glory alone. And so he calls you and me into his family of disciples that love much, just like those women we've been reading about. People saved by his grace alone. If you know you've been saved, not by yourself, not by how pretty you are, how nice you are, but by grace alone, Man, you're going to be lavish in your gratitude. You will worship much. You will give much. You will serve much. I don't care if you've been raised in the church or raised outside the church. If you have come to know Jesus at all, if you have understood the gospel at all, you're on your knees 
in celebration and living, lasting, persevering joy about who Jesus is and what he means to you. Saving faith lives and gives and loves much. Amen? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.